let's just sort of like uh, kick this off with introductions. So, so why don't we just kind of go around and uh, Council Member Fish, tell us a little about yourself. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Alex Fish. I am a council member in Culver City, California. <laughs> Small but mighty. Um, I've been, this is my fourth year, uh, my first term, and it's really been, it's a great job to be involved in city government. Get involved in your local government, and uh, be, you can see amazing things happen. Uh, because most people don't get involved. You have tremendous impact. And Sam, tell us a little about yourself. Henry, please. Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to see you. Thank you for braving the weather with the rest of us today. But um, for those of you who are not familiar with Reef, we do something very simple, but also very complicated at the same time. We uh, transform parking lots into services for the neighborhood. Um, and those services can be kitchens, healthcare, uh, parks micro-mobility hubs, um, even urban farms, you name it. Um, and we have over 8,500 lots across the United States, Canada, Europe, and a growing presence in the Middle East. And we are, um, we're, you know, five minutes away from 80% of the United States urban population. So if you think about that proximity and that access, I think we have the opportunity really to, and the responsibility, to create the city that we dream of, this 15-minute city that we always talk about. Um, and we have the responsibility, too, to create a more equitable and more sustainable and more accessible neighborhood. And so when it comes to food and curbs and stuff like that, this is our jam. So thank you for having us. Thanks for coming. And uh, Jan from LA Taco, tell us about yourself and your piece. So uh, I'm Janet from LA Taco. A location here in Los Angeles that covers uh, basically everything news, in-depth reporting, culture in LA. Um, a lot of what I've done or been able to do uh, with LA Taco for the past two years has been really digging deep, deep into the street vendor community and immersing myself in the street vendor community by you know talking about all the issues that they go through on a day-to-day -day basis, what needs to change, their successes as well. Um, but that's really what I've been able to do just you know, I'm excited to talk street vendors and how, you know, the, the benefits that they bring to Los Angeles, to the communities that we serve um, here in LA. Catherine, Catherine, tell us about City Grows. I, I also love LA Taco, my favorite lot. Thank you. Um, uh, I am Catherine Jenerakis, uh, CEO and co-founder of City Grows. We are an online permitting, licensing, workflow automation tool for local governments. Uh, I'm here because we supported a lot of the sidewalk dining permitting processes for governments uh, here in Southern California and across the country uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, I'm also on the board of Ciclo Villa, another uh, amazing contribution to the of our state. Yes. Uh, thanks so much for having us all. And the man that needs no introduction, but for the unenlightened, uh, Professor Shu, tell us a little about your uh, research. Well, Professor Robert Planet at UCLA, and I, I think I teach the world's only university course on parking. Um, it's, uh, it starts at the end of March uh, in the uh, third quarter of UCLA. I've been doing this in 1970, um, uh, and I think that I've seen more progress. In the last two years, than in any other uh, that I that I looked at, the, there was so much new technology at this at this meeting, as shown just by the previous panel with the Vade and uh, Automotus and a number of the other uh, technology things here uh, that are going to transform parking. Um, and you know. It, 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 uh, the industry that hasn't changed much since 1935. Um, that was when the first parking meter was patented and introduced. And many people are paying for parking now just the way we did in 1935. It was if you put your meter, you put your money into the meter and hope you get back before your time is out. Can you think of any other payment system that has not changed in 1935? 
uh, uh, tickets are given when people get their top off. Uh, that policy came in in the 1920s. So I think that uh, I, I feel much better about uh, the future of parking uh, after I've seen the conference today. I'm glad it could be inspirational then. But um, extrapolating on that a little bit, Professor Shoup, so you know, I, we can understand where we got parking meters from. How did that lead to a world with so much poorly utilized urban real estate, whether it's on-street or off-street parking? Yes, I, I think America and most of the world does exactly the wrong thing with parking. Everything they do is the, uh, the reverse of what they should be doing. Uh, say what I, I the previous speakers talked about three things, and I recommend three things. Uh, one is to charge the right prices for all street parking, uh, and by right price, I mean the, the lowest price the city can charge, and still have one or two open spaces on every block, so when the driver arrives, they'll see exactly what they want to see, an open space with waiting for them. Uh, and to make that politically popular, I recommend using the revenue to provide public services on the major blocks. Uh, so that when the bus goes into a park meter, it comes right out the other side, the sidewalk, so that they wouldn't be covered with black polka dots like all the sidewalks surrounding this block. Um, and they would pay to repair sidewalks, which are in terrible shape of Los Angeles. And they would remove graffiti overnight. So the people who live the work and own property in the area would see that their meter money at work and they could understand and well, yes, maybe it's a good idea to charge for, for on-street parking because it will give us public services that we do not have, especially in Los Angeles. And the third, I think you should remove off-street parking requirements that uh, we're in a parking lot right now. Los Angeles is, is pockmarked with uh, parking lot, something you never want to see, uh, unless you're uh, driving area. And I think that if we remove all street parking requirements, that we'll have a, a opportunity for housing. And, uh, and the, the economy will work much better, say, it does exactly the wrong thing. Uh, compare Los Angeles to San Francisco. For a concert hall like Disney Hall, LA requires 50 times more spaces than San Francisco allows at the back. So if you don't see uh, empty asphalt in downtown San Francisco that you see more off, it's a park So I think that if we get rid of all street parking rules, it'll allow a lot to happen. And I apologize for the mic issue, see if we can swap your mic out. But um, so a lot of this feels, you know, maybe easier said than done politically. Um, so I'm curious, you know, Council Member, Culver City did a great job sort of seizing an opportunity of the pandemic, taking sort of the, the city's main drag uh, for some context, taking what was very wide amount of travel lanes, first building some you know, outdoor dining and more recently some bus and, and bike lanes. What's that process like and, and how can more cities kind of fight that uphill battle? It's a very good question. And I have to take a quick moment to acknowledge Professor Shoup and, and it's really probably his insights that, that made me kind of where I am today. Uh, and I know that studying city government is sort of low on the academic totem poles, supposedly, but I note that in Vox today there was an article about land value tax. So um, it's come a long way, the, the thinking that Professor Shoup has been talking about for 50 years. But, um, the politics of public space is really complicated. Obviously, we all know this. Um, people have exactly the backwards ideas about how cities should function. And we, that's, you know, these kind of come together to give us the world we have with incredible amounts of air pollution, incredible amounts of car congestion, um, very, inexpensive, very expensive housing, and you know, 160,000 homeless Californians. So, I mean, I, the only answer I have on the politics is that people, elected officials need to understand that. Elected officials at local government level need to recognize that we created these problems. Uh, and so it's really, I, you know, it's not a very 
it's not a very uh, scalable message, but it's, it's giving people the information to know to stop doing that and then have the courage to, uh, to make changes that are beneficial in the long term that will come together to create the city that we need um, and endure the backlash. You know, there's an expression I just put in this week, uh, the dogs bark and the caravan moves on. And I think local elected officials and really any elected official need to, you need to internalize that because uh, parking reform is probably the least popular of all of the necessary reforms that we see, um, housing and you know, density, all those things. And it's still popular. When you ask people and tell them you know, about accurately pricing curbside parking and limiting parking norms, people generally say, yeah, that's a good idea. So really, the politics of it are just do it. Just do it and demand that your local elected officials do um, the things that we all know need to happen. Be brave. Uh, another, yeah, I think, important change we saw in light of the pandemic was you know, not just slow streets, but sort of this push for Al Fresco dining, which you know, makes so much sense in a climate like ours. Catherine, you helped you know, the city of LA design and implement that program. Tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that we saw during the pandemic was government doing things that people don't expect a government to do, which is respond very quickly to changing conditions. And uh, we supported uh, the permitting process for restaurants for the LA Al Fresco program, for the city of Los Angeles, also for uh, West Hollywood, San Monica. Those cities chose different strategies and different permitting processes. Uh, our software is very configurable in real time by normal people. So the city of LA, they decided on Wednesday that they were gonna launch that program on Friday. And so they were able to configure a functional permit process where restaurants went online, applied, at the end of 20 minutes could print out their sidewalk dining permit and begin using uh, public space for their operations pretty much immediately, which is something we're incredibly proud of. We also saw, you know, with City of West Hollywood, they, there was a week where they changed the ordinance on a Monday, they adjusted the software on Tuesday, and that was live for their businesses on Wednesday. So I, I think, you know, there's a lot of perception that government is completely sort of calcified and resistant to that kind of fast adaptation, and I think we're, we're at a moment where we've all seen that, that that's not always true, and it, it's kind of given, um, our partners inside of government a sense of, of what they can do, like that they can respond quickly, that they can innovate and see real change in short, you know, in a short amount of time that has real impact for the businesses in their community and their community members overall. And so I think it's a really exciting time. I mean, there's still a ton of challenges around all these. Uh, Reforms, as a uh, council member said, like it's 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 hard to push back sometimes on uh, local resistance to change of how public space is used. Um, you know, hopefully things like Ciclovia that operate with so much joy help to inspire people to be open to these changes. But uh, it's a combination of leadership, technology, and good ideas, really, which all the folks up here. Yeah. And, and how can cities make sure that it's not just, you know, restaurants with wealthy neighborhoods that know about this opportunity, can take advantage of this opportunity? You know, yeah. How, I mean, how does this make it to everyone? Well, I think this is like the data feedback loop too, right? If you have good systems, then you have instant access to information about how and where those programs are being implemented. And so the city of LA looked at the sidewalk dining permitting uh, applications and saw that there were fewer than expected applications from some lower income community, like, you know, not surprisingly, like every restaurant on Larchmont was like on it, right, day one, right? But that's far from our entire community, right? So the city actually partnered with Ciclavia because Ciclavia does so much outreach to local businesses along our routes to reach out to, you know, non-English first language uh, business owners, like uh, restaurant owners in um, in parts of town that were underrepresented in the program to encourage their participation, to try and make sure that those economic benefits were as equally distributed as possible. So it's something, um, again, that people don't always expect is happening, but that kind of feedback loop of analysis, you know, implement a change in your policy to promote equity and uh, inclusion is, again, really inspiring, I think. 
Janet, you've written some amazing pieces about local food vendors throughout the city and county. Uh, there was certainly a surge of those as people responded to economic precarity in the last two years. Um, tell us, you know, how is how is this, you know, this kind of new world affected food vendors? I mean, there were challenges vendors were facing before the pandemic, and those just enhanced during the pandemic, and we're still in the pandemic at the moment. Um, but I mean, drastically, they already don't make enough in a day. Um, you know, there's over ten thousand vendors here in Los Angeles, and I think about 162 of them only have permits. Um, and that's a lot of vendors that are living and working in fear. If it's not uh, the health department, it's law enforcement. If it's not law enforcement, um, it's, you know, brick and mortar businesses or other places that are, you know, are, they have a lot against them. Um, during the pandemic specifically, um, the enforcement went up. There was a moratorium in place, but once that was lifted, it was like hands on deck. Vendors were getting um, uh, their stuff confiscated left and right. Um, specifically, um, because of the pandemic, uh, the health department, the, the, one of the permits that, that they don't have that would allow them to sell freely without fear is the health permit. That permit is impossible to get, nearly too impossible to get for vendors for many reasons. One of them, one of them is, is outdated. It is not written with vendors in mind. Um, definitely not written with vendors in mind. It's written more for like food trucks or restaurants. And when you think of that, that does not apply to a street vendor. Um, and I have my notes just because I have to say some of the requirements are absolutely insane. Um, one of the requirements, I'll just read this off really quick, is you know, four things. Um, 20 cubic feet of refrigeration space. Microwaves, washing stations. When you think of a local vendor, your local hotel, or your poor man, your hot nut vendor, they're not going to be pushing a big cart down the block with four seats. That's just not realistic. Like, that's plain and simple. It's not realistic. Um, and in order for these things to change, you know, the California Food Code law would have to change because, again, it's not written for vendors. And right now, advocates like Inclusive Action, um, Community Power Collective, and um, a few officials are pushing to change this law because not only will it impact vendors here in Los Angeles and give them an actual real pathway for these permits, but it will actually help vendors throughout California because every city follows this law and then they make their own requirements on top of that. So if this law is changed and updated to, to you know, to, what's it called? <laughs> Sorry. to like apply to these vendors that are a huge part of the community, a huge part of LA. I mean, they benefit their community. They are there to serve their community. They're there for breakfast, they're there for lunch, they're there for dinner. It's affordable. There's a lot of food deserts in LA, and there's vendors who are providing fresh produce at a short distance where you don't even have to drive because they're down the block. They're on a curb, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, they've been impacted immensely especially by these sweeps where they get their stuff confiscated and they're losing out on thousands of dollars. I mean, I've interviewed a vendor who, you know, she got her equipment taken away, lost, I think, over $2,000 on equipment that she still was paying. They're accumulating debt, so this law definitely needs to change in order for them to sell freely, to be at events like this, to, to be able to sell where they already do sell and do it without fear. Sam, what's, what's the, the private sector's role in this? We've talked about a lot of ways that the government can kind of, you know, make for a better role here, but, but how can, you know, private parking lot operators, building operators, people that have urban real estate, how can we sort of push for these changes and how do you kind of convince people to, you know, take a leap? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really great question. And um, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but I think the question is, what will cities allow? What will cities and, and counties and states allow us to do, and how fast will they let us do it? All right, because the private sector, as we've seen on this parking lot, you can dream up anything, right? We, we have health care clinics. We saw over the pandemic that overnight you can permit on Prescott Diamond. Overnight you can transform cities overnight. You can have vaccination clinics on the street. And the world, you know, the sky's not going to fall. Um, and so I'm hoping that things like this and like Siglovia 
will give you know politicians the courage um, to say yes to these kinds of things. But um, you know, the difficult part for us is the same difficulties that any kind of restaurant, any vendor faces, is these really, really outdated California food code laws, um, these really outdated uh, county laws. And then for us at Reef, because we're doing things on parking lots, there's a whole kind of mobility aspect to it, right? So we're not talking about brick and mortar, we're talking about flexible assets that can move around and be actually as flexible as cities need us to be, right? And one day we didn't need to be a healthcare clinic. One day we needed to be a kitchen somewhere. And so I think as our cities grow, we need to think about how can we create these safe spaces for people to experiment. Um, and you know, I don't know if Urban Movement Labs is still here, um, but they are a partner of ours, for instance, and they give us a safe space to pilot some stuff. Um, they let us and a lot of other organizations do some really cool stuff, bring all of the city leaders and some you know, other community stakeholders to the table to say, um, this is what we want to do. There's a lot of bureaucratic red tape around it. How can we pilot something in a safe space that's safe for our market and also safe for the community to do and test it out and let's study it. You know, let's see how it impacts the community because I think you know, for the private sector, um, our market analytics and market forces aren't going to go where people need us to go the most, right? We'll go to the places where everybody knows, everybody wants a sweet green salad. And that's really easy to find out. What we don't know is like, what are the communities that are facing food desert issues? What are the, the communities that are resistant to vaccines and don't have access to healthcare? Um, that needs to be in partnership with cities, and I think the only way we do that, at least how we do it, is uh, we partner, and we partner, and we partner, and we pilot, and we pilot, and that's the fastest way we can get it. Um, on top of that, not to go on rent here, is, um, is because, again, because we're flexible, um, you know, we also need to hear from the community. You know, what is the best way to really understand the needs of the community beyond, you know, their representative? Um, and so I think, you know, coming out of the pandemic, hopefully we'll all have opportunity to be together and, and find that information out. And again, kind of operate in a safe, safe um, playground. I'm, I'm glad you said the sky won't fall because the tent sounds like it disagrees, but. It might. <laughs> um, well, one thing that we saw from the pandemic was this sort of beautiful organic emergence of, you know, sort of pop-up markets, night markets, street markets. It was a famous one, uh, Avenue 26, that Jana, you wrote so much about. And it seems like they're, they're sort of often kind of tolerated by the city for a while, and eventually someone complains enough that they get shut down and just sort of, you know, swept on to the next, and, and sort of there's no follow-ups. Uh, how can cities sort of accommodate new uses like that and, and sort of, you know, figure out a way to deal with people's complaints, which can be valid, but still allow for organic new uses to emerge, council member. That, that question ties together. Everybody who just spoke, I was thinking, well, city does that, city does that, city does that. I mean, the things that we're talking about are squarely in the, in the city domain, right? And for example, you know, street vendors, um, you know, the, the permit program when it first rolled out was like $400 or something to register. It's just doesn't make sense, and, and of course everyone, the, the reason is that city staff, the motivation is to not get in trouble, not get your, your elected officials in trouble, not get the public out. The worst thing in the world is when the public goes after a staff member by name, which happens when you deal with controversial things, when public space is controversial. But, you know, so when staff presents a, you know, the street vending issue to city council members, it's here are all the things you could do to the most draconian. So, so and every city council gets the same decision tree where the most draconian option is on that, that sheet. And city, and city staff is going to be kind of quiet and maybe push back if they think it's going to cause trouble. So that's sort of the inherent conservatism of cities. And um, you have to be very intentional to, to overcome that. You have to, be, you have to start from the right place and say, well, you know, State says that street vendors should be allowed, and here are the moral reasons for why that should be allowed. Once you're starting from that right space, then maybe you make the right decisions. And then you have to sort of push city staff along, 
And then the hardest part, you have to have the sense of the public and the, the courage to say no to people when they uh, when you get a small group of people who are, who are sort of sensitive receptors to a change. You know, uh, whether it's street vending, a pop-up market, in our case, the Move Culver City Project, which you alluded to and I kind of neglected to explain is, you know, it's 1.3 miles where we took, uh, where we reduced the space for cars to one lane. We added as much dedicated bus lane as we could and as much dedicated bike and mobility lane as we could. Excuse me, and for, for most people, that's phenomenal. You've got many other street options that are parallel if you're driving. You've got um, peripheral parking to get out if, and, and use this space um, if you are driving. We have a circulator that comes and takes you around the whole route for free every 10 minutes. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we, we had the advantage at the inception of the pandemic and saying this is an opportunity where there's a break in behaviors and we've got a lot of employees coming into this area. When it's done, we know that it's not working as is. We know what will work regionally once this is a network. Um, so let's do it. So we had that that first part we kind of had um, with my colleague Megan Sally Wells, who I see in the audience. Hello, I miss serving with you. Um, we had this opportunity to, to, to move through the process as quickly, because it's a process. You gotta do the process. And, and some a lot of California processes are broken. They reward that um, the reaction, the, the, the no. Um, and so we kind of had the advantage of momentum as the project actually finished. You know, it took about a year to plan and install. It's a quick build, still took a year, uh, which should give you some indication of how fast we need to be working on climate issues. But um, once that rolled out, there had been enough time where activists and, and advocates for mobility had come together to defend the project. So when the initial firestorm came of backlash, there were a lot of people out being ambassadors for the project just organically. And so it was very easy as an elected official to say, this is good, let's let's keep going and see how it works out. And I think it's the same for really any rapid urban prototyping, whether it's a market, uh, whether it's you know a small, small lot you know, density or whatever. So um, so then it really is the sort of wait for the backlash to die down, which it did. It took about a month and people stopped complaining. There's still diehards, but it's fine. So. And, and what would it take to get, say, a, a Pulver City night market? How, how can we get one of those, too? I'll give you my card. <laughs> um, Sam, what about, I mean, I can imagine a, a night market on a, you know, private parking lot of sorts. There's, you know, there's a 66 night market. There's, there's lots of ones, but they always sort of, straight, they yeah. lack some of that sort of authenticity <laughs> and a different price point, different collection of vendors. Is there a way to take some of that, uh, you know, the esprit of an organic night market, but do it on a, a reef parking lot, for example? Absolutely. Um, we actually tested a night market in our hometown in Miami. And we had thought, you know, this is kind of a splashy thing. We don't know who's going to come to this. We don't know, you know, if there are any local vendors who are interested in this. And because, again, we're just these humans so hardwired to be together and be that didn't find these organic opportunities to do it, we had almost all local brands um, jump on board and want to do it with us. It was supposed to be, I think, a two-night affair, and it ended up staying there for three weeks. Um, and the city, you know, loved it so much that we decided to extend it um, and get, you know, our event permit extended also. And so these are one of those things that's like, again, the sky's not falling. Um, we're doing something really cool, and we're supporting, you know, local brands. Um, and how can we make that last? How can we take the momentum that we gain from this and not only, you know, help brands that are already kind of in the market, but also uplift for the vendors that we're talking about because um, what we're talking about really is statewide legislation in some instances. And we're not going to do it alone. We're not going to do it as a reef, a parking lot, you know, operator company. But we, we, we ought to do it sort of collectively as, as an organization or a, a collective that believes that this is important, right? Um, because again, it'll help it'll help our, our lawmakers get that courage and know that there's a loud voice on the other side of it that wants to do something for it. Can I say one thing too? Yeah. I think the uh, like the event to permanent trajectory is important and good because like 
Culver City has been an amazing partner for Cipodia, for example, and I think that probably some of that transition was easier because some of those folks had experienced different mobility options on a temporary basis in Culver City before there was like a semi-permit thing. I think it happens a lot of times with like night markets and vendors and these things will be events. It's sort of um, like immunizes a little bit people to be like, oh, this is, this is actually okay. Like this is good. Like, people have always said about Los Angeles is, you know, why don't we have more outdoor dining here? It's literally the best place in the world in some ways to do it, and there's been relatively happy for that over time. Now we've seen what it can be. We're not gonna go back, right, which is great. I, I think the microphones are almost ready for happy hour. Uh, <laughs> Janet, uh, what would it take to get, you know, the taqueros of the world, the sort of just, you know, average food vendors are just making a living, how can we make a private parking lot night market work for them? What would that take? I think well, first, one of the reasons why a lot of markets, like the non-official markets, um, why they don't reach out to like your local taqueros is for the same fact that these markets require vendors to have permits. If they don't have the permits, they can't, you know, they can't be at these markets. Um, but I think just like everybody was mentioning, just a collaborative effort between everybody, official, city officials with street vendors, because we also don't see that, we don't see a lot of communication between who is in charge, who calls the shot, with the people who are being impacted. In this case, street vendors. Um, you know, we saw, like they mentioned, uh, restaurants going al fresco, and it's like, that, that's what vendors do, you know? But they don't have access to these permits. It's there, but they, there's no way. Like, if, if I could literally explain to you guys, which I can't believe it's so complicated, um, the process to get a permit, and we're just talking about one permit. They require more than one in the city of Los Angeles. But I'm talking about the health permit specifically because that's the big um, bump of the road for them. Um, but yeah, just collaborative effort, communication. If you are doing a market and you're able to invite vendors that may not have the permit, because again, this is gonna take a while. I mean, uh, today you guys had Beverly, um, who had one of the carts, the tamal carts, the first legal tamal cart in Los Angeles history. Just think of that for a moment. The first legal street vending tamal cart, specifically only for street vend for tamal vendors in LA. That is wild to me. And that just shows, and you could ask Matt, you can ask Richard, how long did it take them to get that cart legalized? Years. Years of going back and forth with the health department. So, you know, there's a lot that needs to change um, so we can have more vendors like Beverly come and showcase their food, share their culture um, with everybody else. Is, is Jonah going to start a, a networking organization for all of us? <laughs> I got vendors for you. <laughs> it's three, four underwriting. That's the, I'll do it. But um, Professor Shoup, I'm, I'm curious, you know, it's one thing to remove parking minimums and sort of, you know, hope that the market responds in time. Uh, is there more that states or regulatory agencies could be doing to sort of, you know, not just allow, but encourage some of these more progressive, more interesting uses of urban land? Yes, I, I think uh, actually at the state level is probably the best way to, to make changes. Uh, one was the uh, uh, state requirement that cities allow accessory dwelling units, uh, or convert garages into housing. You know, it's done illegally in Los Angeles all the time. If you find out about it, when somebody dies in a fire or in a garage that um, was, um, uh, had a bad wiring. But the state uh, required all cities to allow um, uh, accessory dwelling units to convert garages into housing. Um, and the some cities fought back. Los Angeles did fight back. But the state legislation overrode it. And since the legislation was passed, there are 17 times more uh, accessory dwelling units approved now than there were four years ago. Uh, and Los Angeles counts that as a trial. Uh, and I think uh, allowing things is probably one of the best things that cities can do. Um, and I think that uh, my specialty is more on the, the curb lane than food, but uh, journalists are, I think, the, the, uh, 
a great source of information on what can be done. One thing that's done in, in other cities is to allow the perimeter of parking lots like this one to be lined with um, uh, food trucks. So as you, the, it's a, the, they, they line the, the parking lot. So as you walk along the street, you see uh, an array of food trucks on the, not at the curb, uh, but on the next to the sidewalk in the parking lot. I understand getting a permit to do that is a nightmare. Uh, but there's this, 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 this obscene amount of asphalt and the city makes it very hard to use it for, for, for anything else. Uh, so I think that it, it, it would probably be a better place. Just think of the, if it were converted from a, a, a car parking or empty car parking into, into food trucks, how, many, how much more sales tax revenue would that produce? How many more people would that employ? Um, I think it would be, if just allowing something like that would be uh, great step forward. And getting back to what the council member said, how difficult reform is, I think that reform is a lot easier if the uh, city promises people that if we start charging for use of the curb lane, uh, we will spend all the revenue to approve your law. Um, and what Pasadena did this, maybe some of you are too young to remember, it must be, Old Pasadena on Colorado Boulevard used to be a skid road. People thought it would never recover because uh, it was built in the 1920s and uh, the very little off street parking. They relied only on this, the, the curb parking, which was all free. Uh, and the uh, city proposed putting in parking meters, and the merchant said, uh, it will chase all the customers we have away, even though most of the storefronts were vacant. And they argued for two years until the, then the city said, if we put in the parking meters, we'll spend all the revenue to rebuild your sidewalks, to clean your alleys, to put in historic street lights and street furniture. And the merchant said, that's different. Why didn't you tell us that? Let's run the meters till midnight. Let's run them on Sunday. Let's charge a high price. It's because the city is almost predatory towards neighborhoods. If the neighborhood has car car parking problems, the city wants to put in parking meters and spend the money anyplace else on anything. Most people probably think it's on pensions for, for, for public employees. So I think if you promise the neighborhood the, the, the benefits of good management and by giving them the revenue, you'll, you'll get more places that look more like old Pasadena than look like West 11th Street. In, in, in this block. You won't find blocks that are mostly asphalt. Just one one thing too, uh, you know, our team at City Grows, we provide technology to local governments, and one of the things that we see that really impacts this process, or, uh, like well-funded restaurant development groups is the permitting delay. And that's partly because there's no coordination between different levels of government. It's the city versus the county versus, and that is a, you know, they are different organizations, but it's also partly because their technologies historically haven't been able to communicate. So it's part of the thing, one of the things that we're trying to do is create a technology that's flexible enough that any level of government can plug in and therefore streamline both conversation around changing parking the permitting process. So just a quick, quick plug for coordination from all the government people here. So I, I would love to end this panel on a, a positive note. So maybe in 60 seconds, I'd love for each of you to sort of to promulgate your vision for a, a, you know, urban California that works well and, and works for everyone. And maybe you know, how do you think we can get to somewhere like that? So big question, little time slot, council member. This is a stump speech. <laughs> well, I mean, um, we could be the third biggest economy in the world in a decade pretty easily if, if we wanted to in California by simply letting cities be cities. Cities are magic. I and mean, we should we should appreciate that. Um, you know, welcome new neighbors. Figure out what I, I, we, we will we should approach housing from the design standpoint and allow a whole lot more of it close to jobs and good schools. We should make sure that there is a network of bus lanes and bike lanes so that any time of day you can get from Culver City to Burbank in 40 minutes. And we should make sure that public space 
is safe for all bodies, whether, uh, whether it's people with disabilities, people who are black. Uh, you need to be able to use the public space that we're enhancing and embracing and investing in and sharing and celebrating safely for everyone. And that's my vision. You've got my vote. <laughs> Sam. Um, all of the things that Mayor Fish said. Um, but, but also, you know, our mission is to bring the world to your world. And so we talk a lot about how mobility and how we're getting, how we get people to the places they need to be. But really, our vision is to bring the things that people need to them. So my vision is, you know, driving here in a ride chair. I was just looking at every block and all of the empty asphalt and thinking about all of them being built with a vendor who is permitted, with a healthcare clinic, with a little mini park, and how that would transform the neighborhood. And so really, my vision is um, the rise of the neighborhood economy. Um, you know, we have, we, our, our starting uh, salary, our starting range is $20 an hour with W-2 employees for any of our big lessons. And so if you can imagine 20 jobs every block, and you walking them, it's not building new infrastructure, it's just changing the way we use it. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's really simple. Going back to street vendors, just hopefully in the future, you know, we're seeing them, as you mentioned, you know, doing what they do now, but on a bigger level without fear, just so they don't have the fear um, to me. That would be super simple. Just a couple of years from now, it's just a year from now, even better. Um, but just so we can, we can see them anywhere without having fear because they see a police coming to the health department because now they have the permits, you know? Even now they're super empowered to pay all the rights and everything, but just a future where, where vendors can really flourish because they're, at the end of the day, they're entrepreneurs as well. Yeah, our team at City Goes is really focused on using technology to change how government works, and our vision is around changing that relationship between both people and businesses and government from being something where government feels like an adversary or an obstacle or an annoyance to more what we've seen over the last two years with some of our government partners where it's facilitating positive change fast when people need it. And I think that's very, uh, you know, like everything changes when that's how you feel about the institutions in your community. And then of course with Ciclodia, we just want to bring like endless joy to our whole region of Los Angeles. Professor Shu. What would improve the world? Uh, well, I think that if we're cities uh, implemented the ideas and the technology that we've heard about today, the world will be a lot better very quickly. Um, the, because the, the current way it has been neglected uh, ever since the Model T arrived in, in, in 1908. The cities. Uh, offered free parking as a free curb parking as the amenity like street sweeping or or um, trash collection uh, and nobody paid much attention to the curb the transportation planners didn't pay any attention to it because nothing is moving in parked cars and city planners didn't pay any attention to it because it's in the roadway nobody was really responsible for thinking about the curb so what's unusual about this conference is that it's focused on something that everybody else has neglected. And I think that there will be so many good ideas that presented today and so much technology shown off today, I think that we can look forward to a lot of improvements in the future. Hey, that's a ringing endorsement, so thank you. And I think, thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, the audience. What an amazing day. Uh, Kick around with our little hour of our kind of uh, happy hour on site. And then uh, from 6 to 8, it's the big after party a block away, so just uh, stay warm for one more hour. But uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Yeah.